It's Monday, July 24th. This is Monday Night Live. We're talking all things powerlifting. If you have a question or a comment, drop it in the chat and we'll reply to it uh, live here on the stream. And um, in the future, if you want to join us on one of these episodes, hit up powerlifting underscore America on Instagram. Send us a DM. Say, hey, I want to be on the live show. And uh, we'll consider it for sure. Uh, we, want, we don't want to make this a free for all, but you know, we'll, we'll send that Zoom link out to some people and get you to join in. And um, so anyway, all right, let's, let's talk about some stuff. First and foremost, we are two weeks out from the North American powerlifting championships. I mean, we're getting really close. Julia, you're competing in the North American uh, powerlifting championships. How is your prep going? It's going, it's going, it's, it, it wasn't going so well for a while, but it's, it's turned a corner and um, I, I remembered how to squat. So I think we're going to be good. I think we're going to be good. Great. Um, so for people who don't know the North American powerlifting championships, it's like our euros. It's the IPF regional event for the North Americas. Um, we call it the North Americans or the North American championships. It's August 8th this year. It's in the Cayman islands. So I'm getting pretty excited about heading down to the Cayman islands. I've seen pictures of the venue it's in, uh, it's, it's in a hotel right on the most famous beach in the Cayman islands, which spoiler alert, Cayman Islands, best beach in the Cayman Islands puts you in like top 10 best beach in the world. So uh, it's going to be just a venue like nothing we've seen before. It'll be right on the water. Um, it's going to be a fun time. Um, this is the biggest North American championships ever. There's 286 athletes coming from 14 countries. We're bringing a huge team with Power in America. We got 108 Power in America athletes across all age divisions, both raw and equipped. We got superstars, Ray Williams, Claire Zai, Mike T, Lane Norton, Susie Hartwood, Gary, Steve Mann, we got Tristan Naselrod in the chat right now. Uh, the 120 kilo national champion will be there. We got Jonathan Garcia um, in the 66s last year's runner up at, at the world championships in South Africa. So it's absolutely a stacked roster. We're bringing a big squad. Canada is also bringing a big squad. Mike Gold, what, um, what are you looking forward to the most about the North American championships? So if I had to boil it down to one, I'm going to have to go with the 120s. I mean, the 120s are stacked. It's not a big roster, only five lifters. But we legitimately have four of these five lifters it would be like primetime lifters at Worlds. Uh, so we got, for the U.S., we got both Tristan Nasalrod and Mike T, right? So we got shooters. He's pretty good. I've, I've, heard of, I've heard of Mike T. I heard he's, I heard he's pretty good. Shooters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think he's a, he's a bit above average. Um, but then as well, we got uh, Bryce Krochik from Canada, um, one of the biggest deadlifters in the 120s or in any weight class for that matter. Um, his deadlift record actually just got broken at Worlds by, um, by Indy, uh, the Bearded Warrior. Um, and then we got this lifter from Belize who's coming in with an 887.5 nominated total, which is pretty massive so we have four Kaylin. lifters who, what yeah kaylin is his name let's put some respect on his name kaylin from belize Kaylin, yeah kaylin katie godoy or something like that i can't pronounce the last name kaylin kaylin so <laughs> yeah kaylin we'll stick with kaylin yeah so we got kaylin mike t bryce and tristan and on nominations are all separated by 20 kilos all 887 and up so we're probably going to see a pretty good battle and probably like some pretty huge numbers. I mean, any of these people would have been in contention at Worlds for the, for the, probably the podium, to be honest. So I think we're going to see some really impressive lifting in this class specifically. Totally. And Julia, what are you looking forward to uh, about the North American, other than your own performance and your own competition, of course, like what are you as a spectator, as an analyst of the sport, what are you uh, the most excited about seeing here in the North American championships? Um, well, obviously I'm excited about the um, 120s as well. I think that that's going to be just, you know, the headliner here. Um, I think that's going to be the big story, but there are some battles in some other classes. So I'm also excited to see the battle between um, Claire Zai and I don't want to butcher her name. Um, Sammy DePass? Sammy DePass in yeah. the... 76s. I think that's, they're both coming in with 
right around the same totals. I know Claire is um, good for much more than, than her um, entry total suggests. Um, and I think Sammy probably is too. And I think it'll be a really good battle there. So I'm definitely excited for that. Um, it's pretty, it's not all that common. Um, it's starting to be more common where we see these really, really close head to head battles um, at places other than worlds um, in the women's divisions. So I'm looking forward to that. And then of course, Ray Williams, um, he's gonna be back on the platform and he just hit a massive squat. I don't know what it was. I didn't see how it moved, but I saw the video of him reacting to hitting it. And um, so I know that he's he's been putting in a lot of work and he's gonna put up something special at uh, this meet as well. Yeah, anytime Ray Williams is at a competition, it's always gonna he's gonna be like the the star of the show. Everyone's gonna want to see it. Um, but I don't I don't want to fast forward over Claire's eye because there's one thing that you didn't mention, which is that she's moved up from the 69s, so she's competing in the 76s, where Sammy DePass is the reigning North American champion. Um, Sammy also just finished eighth, I believe, in the World Championships in Malta. So we'll see. I don't know exactly what her, um, you know how, how good her training can be when she's coming off such a quick turnaround and things like that, but she's a fighter and she's going to push for it. And then I also just want to, you know, Christine Castro is also in that weight class, um, from Canada, um, who's 76 as well. And I don't remember last year, she might've done, she might've been an 84 last year. I can't remember what her, because I, I swear, I thought she won the North American championship last year as, um, as well. So we've got two like reigning North American champions plus Claire's eye in the mix here in the 76s, which I think is amazing. And Christine, she is a, a special person. Like she's a huge advocate for the sport. She's coaching. She'll be coaching out there, all the rest of the lifters throughout the whole week in, in the Cayman islands, um, her and Quentin, her partner who congratulations, they just got engaged, uh, over in Malta while we were there, which that's awesome. It's great to see people in the sport. Also shout out Kimberly Walford just got married, uh, which I believe Kimberly Walford is also, is she on this, uh, roster as well? I, I think I saw that she is, is she in the um, M1s? By the way, for Christine Castro last year, at NAPS, she was a 69. Oh, she, so she was a 69. So she's moved. And did she win? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so, um, sticking in here with the 76 is, um, Sammy, she's, she's amazing. She's her total has been blowing up. Um, Sammy and the Jamaican team came to power the American nationals. The first one in Austin, Texas back in 2020 was at 2022. Um, and Scott, Scott Jennings and Javon DaCosta also came. They both also are reigning North American champions from Panama from last year, uh, Javon in the 93s and Scott in the 83s. Scott just went to um, the World Championships in Malta as well. And if we look at the 83s, I believe we've got a good battle there as well, don't we, Mike? Yeah, so, I mean, in the 83s, we get to see uh, Kafui from Canada, who's represented Canada at Worlds the last few years, um, up until this year, where he came third behind uh, Nick and, um, and Adam Jansen. But he's coming with a 785 nominated total, which is, I believe, this year was his best total ever. The first year he didn't make the team in recent memory, but it was still his best total ever. So, um, I mean, Caffrey versus Scott Jennings, we're going to have like a battle at the top there for two of the lifters that are trying to approach that 800 mark. Definitely. And in the 93s, I'm just looking at the nominations. Javon's got his work cut out for him here. Um, with Thomas Gear coming from Canada with a 791 and, and Javon nominated with a 780. So there's going to be battles. There's going to be shakeups. There's more people coming this year. Like I said, it's the biggest North American championships ever. Uh, there's more countries involved. So the, the battles are going to be tighter. There's, you know, um, top lifters, uh, basically damn near every weight class. We, we've got a, a big squad. Canada's got a big squad. And then um, all the other Central American countries, Mexico has got a big squad. Um, so yeah, it's going to be awesome. Any other thoughts you guys want to talk about with the uh, North American championships? I know on the master side, we got the return of Susie Hart with Gary, right? In the 52s, um, legendary goat, um, one of the most decorated lifters of all times. Um, do we, we have John? The, we got the lane battle. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Go. Let's hit that. Go ahead and tell it, explain it to us. I mean, so Lane has been battling uh, the last couple of years with Gabriel Garcia, 
Uh, but uh, this year we're having, we have three people. We have Gabriel Garcia, Lane, and then Michael Grazo from the US, all nominated within five kilos. So that's definitely going to be a very good battle. 755 yeah. to 759.5. If you look, if, if you paid any attention to uh, Masters Nationals in Scottsdale, there was an awesome battle between Lane and Michael. And, um, you know, Lane ended up ended up kind of, you know, running away. I wouldn't say running away with it. I mean, he, Michael definitely forced Lane to have a very good day or else he was going to lose. And um, Lane actually had to go out and hit his last deadlift in order to win. So it wasn't like a situation like at the world championships in Canada last year where Lane didn't need his third deadlift in order to beat Gabriel Garcia. And that was because Gabriel had missed a couple of lifts and things like this, but Gabriel is a formidable opponent. And so is Michael Garazzo. And Michael is being coached by none other than Mr. Undeniable, Jonathan Keiko. And so, and I've been watching uh, Michael's training. I think I reposted some of it on the power of Teen America page his numbers are popping off. Lane is in for a three-way battle here. So that's going to be exciting. If you know Lane, you know, you know, he's the ultimate competitor. He's going to go all out. It's going to be exciting. He's going to put on a show. And um, so that that's going to be a super exciting one to watch for sure. Julia, what do you, what's your take on it? Yeah. I mean, I was at um, Masters Nationals in Scottsdale and I was watching that battle keenly and I, um, you know, there was, there was definitely a period of time where, you know, we didn't know who was going to win and it actually looked like, like Lane might not. Um, so I think that with that battle having been this close, um, you know, everyone knows where everyone else stands and um, everyone's going to be pushing quite a bit to uh, make sure that they come out on top. I think that, um, you know, Michael getting coached by uh, Keiko is a brilliant choice, and I can't wait to see um, how he does as well. For sure. And just to hit off on a couple of the other masters, um, we got a big squad of M4s here. There's one, two, three, four, five male classic M4s, including the legendary John Laflamme is in there. Also, Dale Garlit, shout out to him. I saw just today, he hit an all-time squat PR in his 70s. He hit his biggest squat of all time just, just in the last couple of days in his 70s. What an inspiration to see. Uh, John Laflamme puts on a show no matter where he goes. He'll be like pulling over 500 and stuff and pretty much making everyone who's under 70 feel bad about themselves um and their progress because he just keeps pushing and pushing so um there's some legends in there but we got a big squad of masters like we already mentioned i also want to mention uh on the women's side uh, in the open team we've got a sub junior lifter that i think everyone is going to be talking about uh come fall when the summer is over and the dust has settled on the on the summer we got luella bowden in the 84 plus and mike you want to talk about luella a little bit yeah, so um, she competed at Open Nationals and um, she totaled 530. Um, but recently her training has looked kind of crazy. Um, her squat was 220 in comp, but she has squatted potentially not the comp standards, but she has squatted in like the 260, 270 range in the gym, which is just insane. So, I mean, um, she's competing at both NAPFs and jun and sub junior worlds, which are very close to each other. So we're not sure exactly what she's going to do about that, but I'm definitely curious to see what she could do on the platform because, um, I expect some massive squat. We'll see how big, but that definitely yeah. will be one of the highlights to watch. Um, what would you do if you were her? Um, like, like what's the strategy as far as, um, you know, competing so close together because like we mentioned um she's she's also going to go try to win the world championship in the sub juniors in Romania and that's only like a week and a half maybe two weeks by the time the classic side of sub junior worlds rolls around and so at, at North American championships the classic part is at the beginning of the week it's at the beginning of the competition and then at junior worlds it's the opposite where the classic is at the end of the competition so she might have a full two weeks in between but Mike, what would your, your coach, you know, what would your strategy be as far as like, what would you do at North Americans versus what would you do, uh, try to try to pull off at the world championships in Romania? So obviously it comes down to priorities. Like 
what are you trying to prioritize? But just looking at a, a quick look at both rosters, um, I think her closest competition in either roster is going to be fellow American Chelsea at um, Sub Junior Worlds. So honestly, what I would probably do is if this is like two weeks out, so two weeks out, you're generally having like some form of pretty heavy SPD day or pretty heavy training either way. So she could probably do something like an RP8 SPD day at NAPFs and um, win and then just continue peaking into junior worlds and then put up whatever she wants, like whatever crazy number she wants to hit, probably do it there. But I'm just going to guess that's not what she's going to do because in general, when people like sign up for multiple meets, multiple international meets, they usually want to like show up. Like people don't usually just sign up just to like have a casual day. It's not a, not common. So even though what I, what I would personally do is not push it too much at NPFs, I do expect her probably to push it. You expect her to push it at NAPF? Yeah. I don't think she should, but yeah, I yeah. do expect her to. Yeah. If you're going to sign up, uh, what, what do you think on this, Julia? What's your take? Yeah. So I think that this could be kind of a, a practice run for her. I know she's very young and, you know, junior worlds is it's the world stage. Um, so I, I could see her maybe having signed up for this, wanting to get some experience in on the international stage in front of these IPF judges with, um, you know, a little less pressure on her before she, she steps onto that world stage. But um, I, I don't, I don't really know um, what her game plan is. I think, you know, it would probably be good to hold back a little um, as Mike said, uh, but, you know, uh, a lot of these younger lifters, they, they want to um, give it all they got every time. And um, one benefit of being so young is that you can recover a little better um, especially if you haven't been lifting as long as some of these more seasoned lifters, um, and you can be a little more flexible with that kind of thing. Um, but I, to me, this looks like it's, it's going to be, um, a, a trial run for, um, IPF judging and, and all of that. Yeah. I mean, if you think back to nationals in Austin, where she competed in the open division, um, it, it, at, in in, uh, in Austin, you know, at the classic open national championships for power in America, there was some issues with the standard, you know, and as far as like hitting her lifts to a standard. So I could see that being part of it is like a practice run before the world championships. I think, you know, like Matt Gary says, there's only one day out of the year when you can become a world champion. And so definitely the focus, uh, in Romania will be to secure that gold medal. But I think what she wants to do, and I've heard rumors is that at the North American championships, she wants to go all out on her squat. I believe, is it her squat, Mike? That's her biggest lift or is it her bench? And yeah. So she... It would yeah, be squat. Um, if you saw in that post, I uh, shared with you earlier, um, with that lifter from Nauru, it mentioned that the sub junior squat world record, uh, Leanne Hewitt's record. Well, your audio just cut out, Mike. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. You're back. So go ahead. Yeah. So um, the sub junior squat record is uh, 262.5 from Leanne Hewitt. Um, so Luella attempted to double 265 in training. It was definitely high, but the point is it looks like she has like a specific number on her head, which would be that sub junior world record squat. So it's very possible that she makes a play at the squat there to try to get the um, sub junior world record and then just plays to try to win at sub junior and junior worlds. Yeah, I think that's the play. I think that's what she's aiming for. Now, the the sort of drawback of that is that you go all out and try and break a world record squat and then turn around and compete at the highest level two weeks later, that might be difficult. And if she ends up doing it, breaking the squat world record, having a great day in the Cayman Islands, going nine for nine, well, then that's all great and fine and well. And, and like Julia mentioned, she's young. She'll probably be able to recover pretty fast and she can, you know, turn it around back and, and compete in Romania. But if things don't go well, 
if she doesn't hit depth, if she doesn't get that world record squat, which is the thing that she's been aiming for, um, then, then, I mean, it'll be a question of how does a young athlete like Luella respond and rebound in a, such a short period of time? Um, it can be a, a little bit of a mental game as far as, you know, um, if you have, if you have some failures at NAPF, then it's going to be difficult to recover from that mentally walking into Romania, especially when you got to go against Chelsea Enamore, who is an absolute beast over here and whose training is popping off and who is taking her time. She's not going to North American championships. She's saving all her energy and focus for the world championships. Um, she's, she's already competed in two nationals. She's the high school national champion, and she's also a sub junior national champion. So she's got two rings already this year. She's managed to get her lifts through two times now with power of the American national level refing. So she looks and feels, I think real competent going in. I hope that things work out great for Luella. If she hits that squat world record, she'll be on such a high heading into Romania. It'll be difficult to stop her, but if she doesn't, it's risky. It's a risky move. This is Overall, what's your guys? You're both coaches here. You're right. Both of you coach. Would you guys do this? Would you go to North Americans and then go turn around two weeks and, and try to go win a world championship? No. I, the only way I would do that is I, we haven't seen her bench or deadlift training. If she was under the impression that she's so far ahead, that's the only way I would do that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, Chelsea's trainings look really good. And also her lips are very clean. So like, it looks like everything she does, all three lifts are too standard. Like she doesn't really have any surprises like waiting for her. So I expect her to come in and have like a huge day in Romania. But unless like Luella's training has like popped off, which it could be, meaning obviously the fact that she's taking these massive squats to some extent means that she definitely is stronger. Um, I haven't seen a single bench or deadlift video. So I have absolutely no idea where, where she is on those. But like if she thinks that real, if she somehow thinks that like she's good for like a 620 or 630 total, which would be like absolute insanity. But if she does think that, then I can understand just like going for the record and then thinking that you're not going to have to worry about it. But if she's like, if she thinks she's pretty close, like a, expecting a pretty close battle at sub junior worlds, which I would say I probably do expect like a, a good battle, like in the mid to upper fives. Um, then I think it's just a bad idea. And Julia, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think I'm of a similar mind. Like I said, um, you know, if it's financially within the means of the athlete, I don't think it would. It's a horrible idea um, to go um, and get some practice in in front of IPF judges. But again, with younger lifters, especially if they're attempting, you know, a world record or they're close, um, it it should really only be practice and I don't I don't see that happening and um I I would you know I would say that you know the focus should be worlds that's the biggest stage you know that's the goal is to bring home a gold from worlds um and yeah you know this this battle between um her and, and Chelsea um is it's far from over um I think you know it has the potential to become like a, a Daniela Amanda type situation um, yeah. if everything is played out right. Um, and, you know, I don't want um, either athlete thinking, you know, whatever happens, this is the end of the world, but. Um, oh yeah. It's just sub juniors, right? Like they, these, yeah. they got, both of them have a very bright future. These will yeah, be great but, learning lessons for both of them. Go ahead. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, but at the same time, you know um, it's, it's probably good for younger athletes to learn um, how to be strategic um, as early in their career as possible, because it could save them a lot of heartache. Um, you know, I know I've done you know, four meets in a year before, I think, and it didn't work out too well for me. Um, so I, I would probably try to hold her back a little bit. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's her choice and we have to learn these lessons um, one way or another. So, you know, I wish her the best and I'm really excited to see the battle go down um, at Worlds. I think it's going to be really good. I'm really excited that to see so many incredible young athletes in these higher weight classes. Um, I think that that is uh, something that we've been missing on the women's side a little bit. Um, and yeah, it's, I mean, it's phenomenal to see them putting up these huge numbers on squat at such a young age. I mean, you know, a few years ago, this would have, I, I wouldn't have been able to imagine this when I first got into the sport.
So definitely it's a bright future when it comes to 84 pluses and it kind of chimes right in with, you know, the most, we, we talked about this in our recap show. If you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to our takes on what happened at the world championships in Malta. We talk a lot about the 84 pluses, which the 84, everyone in the world in powerlifting right now is talking a lot about the 84 pluses. So it's an exciting weight class. Um, you know, there's rumors out there about Alexis Jones possibly coming over to powerlifting America. I believe, is she currently a junior, Mike? Yeah, yeah. Alexis Jones is a junior. Um, we got Chelsea yeah, Anamore and Luella Bowden are both sub juniors. So, I mean, this is a really, really, um, you know, exciting weight class. That's really on the come up for sure that everyone is going to be talking about. Everyone's going to be looking at, um, to wrap up the North American championships. Um, just looking on the women on the classic side, um, like I mentioned on the men's side, there, there's 19, uh, women classic masters lifters here as well. So there's tons of masters lifters up. I'm just kind of scrolling through the names. Um, Gail Williams is a world champion M4 at the top of the deck. Um, we got Dora justice in there. She's a crowd favorite, huge bencher, um, slaps herself in the face, um, and like does like bow bows and stuff afterwards. She's a, she puts on a show. Um, I think Vicky Brackett's a world champion. Uh, Susie Hartwig Gary, one of the most decorated lifters of all time is making her international platform return, um, in the M twos. Um, we got Lillian Jackson in there as well. She's world champion from last year at, um, uh, at masters worlds. I believe she was the world champion, um, last year at masters worlds. Let me see. No, it won't let me click on her, but uh, Claudia Nagata also in there. She's amazing. Joa Ayanada, who just like dominated at Na Masters Nationals in Scottsdale, put on a hell of a performance. Um, she's all over our Instagram page. So if you want to go back and look, you can you can see the performance. Um, just go to powerlifting underscore America on Instagram and you can learn about all of these different athletes. But yeah, so there's a bunch of them in there. It's going to be exciting. We also are taking a full squad on the classic side, at least of juniors and sub juniors on both the men's side and the women's side. And then, um, when we pull into the equipped side of things, we got 17, uh, women equipped lifters. And on the men's side, we have 10 equipped lifters, uh, including Michael Rodriguez, who's in the chat right now, asking us tough questions, um, as well as Thomas Sencic, who's won like a bunch of world championship bench press world championship, uh, I believe just earlier this year. Um, and just a bunch of other great lifters in here as well. Uh, Mark Liebrich, Nelson Martinez, Nelson puts up like these insane squats, uh, in the one Oh five. So you're going to get to see him, uh, at the North American championships as well. So yeah. Any final thoughts on the North American championships before we move on about on the next topic that we want to get into? No, I um, guess we, I would just say one thing we didn't really cover so much. Just Jonathan Garcia came yeah. second at worlds. Just. Uh, hasn't competed since uh, PA Nets. And I'm just curious to see whether he can get over 700 kilos. I think he's definitely he's definitely capable of it. He's a massive squatter and a massive bencher. Um, deadlift is his like weakest of the three lifts. But um, I'm just curious what – there's not, not really going to be anybody pushing him, but just curious to see what he can put up. Yeah, um, he definitely is a guy that like trains in silence. He doesn't post a lot of his footage. He doesn't post a lot of his training videos. He trains in his own home gym, which is like a spectacular home gym, by the way. He's got tons of equipment in there. Um, and, you know, he's just building in silence. And so who knows what he could do? I mean, what was the total that won the world championships this year, Mike? 705? 7075 or 705? Uh, uh, maybe 705. Yeah. And so, I mean there's a big question is if Jonathan Garcia and, and that was Pana who did that, he checked his ticket for Sheffield. Right. Um, what if Jonathan Garcia comes in and puts up a seven ten or a seven fifteen? I, I think it's possible. I, I, mean, I think seven fifteen might be a little, a little, um, pushing it, but I definitely think there's a, a very realistic chance that he can put up that seven Oh five, maybe a little more. Yeah, I mean, so then what does that do in terms of like Sheffield conversations? You know, um, it probably puts his name in the mix for a potential wild card spot. Um, if he's totaling five, it's gonna be a little, it's gonna be a little hard because I've already been going through the wild card stuff. And yeah, because of regional invites, um, I am almost sure that Kyoto gets the regional invite, there you which go. means there's really not many, not many um, wild cards that are actually available. 
So, and especially see, in the sixty sixes, then because there'd already be two. Well, I mean, in general, I mean, in general, yeah. there aren't many wild cards available. So, if there aren't so many, like on last year, there were a lot of uh, there were a bunch of weight classes that didn't have an automatic invite in terms of uh, the ninety five percent. But yeah, it wasn't like that this year. So, if there's only a few wild cards, it's going to be very tough. So, even if he does get over what Panda did, and he, forget about that, even if he goes over the world record. I still don't know that they even consider anybody who didn't, who didn't do worlds. Meaning you, you don't have to have done worlds. You have to have done an international competition, but yeah, I don't know if they would, if they would um, make that jump. So. Yeah. Um, what's your take on it, Julia? Yeah. I mean, He's definitely one of the more underrated lifters or, or less talk about lifters. Um, and I think he does have the potential to go over um, 700. But, you know, like Mike said, I don't really know um, a whole lot about what the, the selection process will be for wild cards. I mean, this is only Sheffield's second um, second go around. And um, I, I wouldn't be surprised, you, you know, for them to be um, taking people um, mainly from worlds i think it takes a spectacular performance to um get a an invitational or a or a wild card spot not from worlds so, you know we saw um carlina get one but she totaled 600 kilos so it's it's one of those things where you know i think he can come in and i think he can you know turn some heads and put up something um, where people will have to be watching out for him and he will be in the conversation. Um, but I'm not sure that it's going to get him to Sheffield. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, all right, we're like 30 minutes into this already. Um, just an update. Heather just messaged that she's probably not going to be able to make it. We'll see. Um, I left the door open as a, you know, just pop in anytime. She had some issues going on with traffic or something. Um, and I'm sure she'll tell us about it. We'll try to get her on here next week. We'll try to get Heather Connor in here as much as possible. Everyone loves her and she's great. Her and Mike Gold have a lot of on-camera chemistry from the world championships where they did some pregame shows, live pregame shows. Those are all still up on our page, by the way, if you want to go back and relive those moments from the world championships. It was super fun. Great, great sports talk on there with Heather. Uh, I remember those ones really vividly. Um, so we're going to move on to talk about sub junior and junior world championships. But first, Mike Rodriguez in the chat is asking what happened to last week's live event. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys saw that question. Um, but the long and short of it is we got banned brother. So, um, it's no more, it's the mythical first episode. This will forever be known as the first episode going forward, but, uh, the OGs who listen to it live will always know what it is. And, uh, maybe there's some clips that we can pull out of there and post them up as short little videos, short little takes, um, on, on what we were saying last week, but, uh, we can't really get into it. We don't want to get banned again this week. So, uh, let's, let's keep it, let's keep it all above board here and, uh, keep it focused on everything powerlifting America. And, um, we'll move on to the, to the junior and sub junior world championships in Romania. This is, uh, starting August 24th. So like we mentioned, um, North American championships starts on August 8th, turn right around and go to Romania, August 24th. We got a loaded team over here going up against the world's best. We've got a completely full squad on, on, on all sides. Now, just for everyone that doesn't know, um, the first part of the week for the sub junior and junior world championships will be the equipped teams. So we have a sub junior equipped team. We have a, a junior equipped team, both men and women, and then it'll move into classic later on in the week. Um, and so that'll be where we have our sub junior men and women classic and, and, um, and then junior men and women classic as well. So, um, before we go too far into the junior and sub junior world championships, I just want to note that on YouTube here, I did make a playlist called, I believe it's called junior and sub junior worlds team, something like that. And it has all of the content of anything that we've done with any of the juniors and sub juniors that are on that world's team. So like, for instance, Luella Bowden did a press conference in Austin after her performance at open nationals, that'll be on there. Carolyn Connor and Alex Sador also did a press conference after their performances at the open national championships in Austin, Texas. That'll be on there. We did an interview with joy, uh, on the podcast that's on there. Joy Reinfleisch. 
We did an interview with Anthony McNaughton. That's on there. All right. So anything we did with juniors and sub juniors, we'll keep putting on there. And uh, we like, for instance, one of the most recent things is we did a podcast with the 57 kilo sub junior superstar, Eleni Guerrera. That one is also up on there as well. So definitely if you're into juniors and sub junior lifting, go get caught up, go learn about the lifters, go follow them on social media. We post them all up in our stories and uh, get to know them and be ready to cheer them on whenever the world championships comes around. All right. So Mike, we'll go to you first again on this one. What are you looking forward to most uh, at the junior and sub junior world championships in Romania? So actually I've already uh, changed my answer from last week. Okay. And the answer is there isn't a specific person that I'm like looking forward to the most more. It's we're actually going to see some insane battles. So if anybody looks at the roster, which is available on good lift, yeah. um, you can notice the depth in these classes are absolutely insane. Like in a lot of these classes, um, the 74s, the 83s, the 93s, all these classes, I mean, all of them basically, but those three, like specifically, I was just looking at how far down the line, but um, the depth in all these classes is absolutely insane. So we're going to be having battles like for the podium. We're going to have people who, who are nominated on the podium that might finish in ninth, like in different weight classes. Like these are all realistic. And actually I've been in contact with a lot of the non-American lifters over the last couple of weeks that are going to be at junior and sub-junior worlds just from different countries. And it's just very interesting to see um, all these lifters from countries that have, haven't really had much to any uh, open representation, but they're sending junior and sub-junior teams out. And there are really strong people that literally nobody knows about. So like I was having a conversation with uh, a bunch of kids from Lebanon today. And like, nice. they're bringing a bunch of team, they're, they're bringing a bunch of people who are like going to be in contention for like the podium that like nobody knows exists. In just different mm -hmm. countries like that. So I, I think I think it's going to be like just a lot of really good lifting. Um, if I have to break down to one, definitely the 93s are going to be absolutely insane. 93 juniors? Yeah, 93 juniors. So we got a rematch of last year with Shane and we got Yulong from Sweden. But then in addition, we got Peyton Johnson who competed at our nationals and put up a pretty surprise, like huge performance. Uh, yeah. could have won if, could have won if uh, certain things changed. Um, we're not really going to get into that. Um, and then Nathan from Great Britain, who was part of the 83 battle last year. So he's moved up to the 93s and he's also, he's really strong into the 800. So those four at the top, oh wait, and oh, and also, uh, the French kid, uh, uh Malik, he was a sub, sub junior last year. He actually, uh, I believe put up the heaviest total for any sub junior ever um, as an, as a 93. And now he's moved up into the juniors. So there's really five people that are like all into the eight hundreds and are all like, like really close. Like any of the five can realistically win. So. Yeah. yeah um, just looking at the 93 is one through six is nominated with 800 kilo totals and up. Um, and then, especially if you're looking at like, um, third, fourth, and fifth, they're all at 815, 813, 812.5 nominations. So super close battles there. Um, and then of course, yeah, Yulong with the 831. And then our guy Shane with the 818. Uh, looks like it they might be in like a battle for for first, but we just saw this battle with Peyton Johnson and Shane Nutt in Scottsdale, which we didn't do a recap show or anything for Scottsdale. This was definitely one of the highlights of the whole competition. This was one of the closest battles. Um, if you don't know Peyton Johnson, which it was really funny, uh, Shane, I remember like after all the dust had settled, all the chalk had settled, um, Shane just came over and just said, who are you to Peyton Johnson? Because like he pushed him to the wire. And, um, if you listen, actually that's one I got to add to the juniors, uh, playlist. Um, we did a press conference with Shane and Chloe and Dak. Um, all up there on the podium and answering questions. And they went into a lot. Uh, Chloe was the one calling the numbers for Shane. And she did a great job of basically pushing uh, Peyton beyond his capacity on his final deadlift. And that ended up being the thing that decided it. And it was close. And I mean, I'm telling you what, like, like the, the atmosphere in the room was electric because these kids were putting on a show. Um, Peyton Johnson's Instagram handle is quad sauce. He doesn't post a lot, but um, I got to see him compete out in Reno, like in October. And everyone out there was just like, you got to watch this kid, Peyton Johnson. You got to watch him. He's, he's something special for sure. 
don't see anything about him again until in person in Scottsdale, boom, goes head to head, pushes Shane Nutt, one of the most uh, veteran established, you know, one of the best lifters really on the, in all of the juniors um, in, in the world, really. Um, and you know, he went toe to toe with him. So that is absolutely something special. Um, no, let's get into it, Mike. What, what, what happened in Scottsdale? You, you don't, you don't have to, uh, be rude about it, but like, what, tell us like, what were the, what was the, the drama about and what was the mistakes that were made? So it's been a while, so I don't have the numbers pulled up or remember exactly. Yeah, it's but fine. Basically, uh, Peyton was a little bit behind coming into his third deadlifts. And Shane put in a massive placeholder for his third deadlift that was way over anything he's ever done in comp, way over anything he's ever done in the gym. And um, Peyton, I guess, thought it was real. So he loaded way too much, like 20 kilos too much. And uh, it was just a little bit too much. So um, if he had just taken like a normal attempt jump, like he would have, I mean, any any normal attempt jump he would have had, but he took a jump because he thought Shane's number was real. So it cost him the uh, national championship. So, I mean, well, that basically is a lesson in game day handling, game day coaching. Um, and like, I would just listen to the King of Lifts pod- podcast today with Joe Stanek, and they're just going on and on about how the importance of game day handling, you know, game day coaching is so, so, so important because this is a move right here. Like I saw it unfolding as well. I saw the number up. I saw the number up that Shane had and that Chloe and Shane had put in. And the scenario was basically Shane was ahead and then they both went out and missed right in, in the end. And yeah, I mean, Shane, Shane didn't even pull. He just, yeah, he didn't need to. Yeah. Exactly. So that's something that you can do when you have a huge deadlifter like Shane, where people may think that, that, oh my God, this could be possible because he's a crazy big deadlifter. But like you said, if, if you know, if you had scouted Shane before, like you just mentioned, that number was something that was way bigger than anything he had ever done before. Right. And anything bigger than he'd done in training. So you would have known it was a bluff number. See, um, the crazy thing looked- here is that Peyton really was the bigger deadlifter. So uh-huh. meaning not, not only might he have been stronger than they, he, is, he was the bigger deadlifter. So he kind of just, I, I guess, fell for the bluff. But yeah. it happened. Yeah. I mean, you said that you had uh, Shane on for the for a, um interview. I would really love to actually listen to a podcast with Peyton because – uh, I don't, most people don't really know much about him. He like doesn't post much on Instagram and I'm just curious where he came from. And so if you have him on, I think that'd be an entertaining podcast. Yeah. He's out in hey, Reno. Hey, Reno. We're getting some uh, feedback uh, here. Feedback if you, here. one of you guys want to mute yourself, I think it's you, Mike. It's you, Mike. Um, yeah, we're getting it. We're getting some uh, uh, like the echo. I'm hearing my own voice back. Were you hearing that Julia? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So um, now that you muted, it's fine. But um just talking about his, his Instagram handle is quad toss Peyton Johnson's who we're talking about. Um, yeah, he's a great, he's very quiet. Like I've tried talking to him when I was out in Reno, um, watching him in October and then just seeing him after the meet as well. Like he was very quiet. The interview that we did was, it was our post competition press conference, um, with Chloe and, uh, Shane also damn another wedding that just happened. Congratulations to those two belated. I told them in Scottsdale happy, you know, uh, congratulations in advance and everything like that, but they just got married like a week ago, two weeks ago as well. So it was a lot of things happening in our powerlifting family over here in powerlifting America. But, um, but yeah, we'll see if we can't get Peyton on it at a minimum, we're going to get a post competition press conference with him in Romania. Um, that's a good time to mention that we will have our media team uh, on hand at both the North American championships, as well as the world championships in Romania. So that'll be exciting. So we'll get to bring you all that type of coverage that you saw us doing in Malta. We'll be doing that again. Um, Julia, what is something that you're, we, we harped on the 93s a lot here. That was a fun, uh, conversation because of the strategy that went into that, that, uh, final pulls down there in Scottsdale. But um, what are you looking forward to most about the junior and sub-junior world championships? Um, so obviously um, I'm looking forward to um, the 84 plus sub-juniors. Um, I think that's going to be an amazing thing to watch. Um, both 
the two contenders are obviously the two top contenders are from um, Powerlifting America. Um, and that's really going to be something where it's shaping up to be a two person battle. And those, those are always really fun. Um, but there's also um, a battle shaping up in the, in the 69 kilo class with um, in the juniors with Carolyn Connor, because she's been hitting some huge, huge lifts and it almost looks like she's going to be in reach of those French lifters who, um, by the way, both of them have the exact same entry total. Um, so I think the 69 kilo class for the juniors is going to be really exciting as well. Um, so those would be my two uh, things. And, um, you know, of course, uh, let's Alani not fast forward past Carolyn. Let's talk about Carolyn a little bit deeper here. Um, so Mike, you're very familiar with her training. So, um, let, tell us a little bit like the progression of Carolyn Connor over the last year. Yeah. So her training has gone pretty crazy over the last like year or so. Um, last year at sub junior last year, well, starting last year at uh, PA nationals, um, she totaled um, under 400. And then through the year, from, through uh, Junior Worlds, then whatever, uh, I'm not sure if she did a meet in between Junior Worlds and nope. PA Nats again nope. this year. No, okay. So then to PA Nats, her totals like exploded. So she has a really, really, really strong squat. And she's always had a pretty good squat. But um, she's coming in with a uh, 178 nominated squat. Uh, she just doubled 180. Uh, her squats going like really well, and her deadlift most recently has like improved significantly. So um, she had a huge deadlift PR at PA and Nats this year, and her deadlifts continued to like just blow up. So uh, and her bench also increased. So all of her lifts are trending like well up. Like um, I expect probably all of her seconds to maybe be over her current PR. So we're talking like maybe something like on a good day, uh, five around where the top people are nominated. Like she could reasonably put 30 to 40 or whatever kilos on her total. And I, mean, I think it's going to be a great battle. So we have the two French lifters who are nominated one and two, uh, both with 515, which is insane. And then uh, don't forget about the lifter who's nominated third, uh, Noemi Fantone. She was part of the crazy battle at Euros with the um, 69 juniors. So that whole, all these 69 juniors are like insane. Uh, it's honestly, it's a little disappointing that we're missing some. Like there are a few of them who ended up not signing up for junior worlds that are still juniors. But I think this can be a really good class. Um, I expect probably all four of these lifters to be like relatively close, all over 500 which is a very strong total. I mean, very 69 opens with 500 is a very strong total. All these, all these lifters are lifters who, as soon as they reach the open will like probably be, I mean, they'll all be primetime lifters the second they reach the open. So this can definitely be probably the best class to watch uh, on the female side. So actually, definitely one of the best classes to watch on the female side for sure. Totally. Um, I mean, if you get on the podium in the 69 juniors at this world championships, you've done something like that. Bron that bronze medal will never look so good as it does with this, because it's like um, the, every one of these ladies here in these top four are killers. Um, Carolyn Connor has never done a local meet. She only yeah. did uh, junior nationals, then the world championships in Turkey. Then she did open nationals in Austin. Then she did junior nationals in Scottsdale. She's only done national and international competitions. So she's currently being groomed to be like one of the greatest of all time. Like if you look at her resume, um, and she's still a junior, so she's got a lot, a lot of time to prove she's still a young junior. I mean, she's only like 19, 20 years old. Um, I think she might've just had like a 20th birthday recently. Um, she still has a lot of several more years left in the juniors as well. Um, and so if you look at the nominations, yeah, she's the youngest of all of these top four that we're talking about. So when they all age out and she's still there, it'll be her weight class to win. And by then she'll be totaling like five thirty something crazy. Just look at her totals though. Like, so she's only been competing since last June. So just a little bit over a year that she's been competing and her total is 380.5, 400, 
437.5, 470.5. So, I mean, she's adding like 30 on average, like something looks like around 30 kilos per competition that she does. And so if she comes in with that nominated 470, she adds 30 kilos. So that should be right at 500. So it'll be cool to see. It's going to be an amazing battle. And also you never know what's going to be happening with those ladies at the top. Um, Samantha Eugenie and Andarina from, from France, if they're actually battling, if someone's trying to pull for gold, something like this, you know, there's a lot of different uh, game day uh, scenarios that could unfold that could open up a spot for Carolyn to take someone's spot on the podium to move up from a bronze to a silver, you know, whatever, Mike, what were you going to say? Yeah. Like I gonna... just want to note, like uh, the top, they have the same nominated totals, the top two, but in reality, uh, Samantha just deadlifted to, for the win. But I mean, she has a bigger deadlift than what she did yeah. likely. So uh, I mean, I expect potentially more than that. Like she, she's try, she hasn't actually pulled more than that in a meet, but she's loaded way more than that in the gym, and she's attempted more than that, like in the past in competitions. And she's still like growing into the 69s. Like this is her first year out of the 63s, so mm-hmm. she still has to pull out the 69. So I, I'm thinking that um, 515 probably won't be enough to actually win this, but. We'll see. I mean, 515 is a very big total, so it's definitely possible. Like, I mean, 515 and as a 69 junior, you have to have a really good day. So, yeah, I just we'll hope see. that Carolyn, you know, just has herself a day, has fun out there. She's competing with some of the best lifters in the world here. I mean, in these are lifters that can compete in the open for sure. Um, she has that open experience, all that kind of stuff. So I just hope she has a great day and doesn't put too much pressure on herself because she's still a young junior and has plenty of time uh, from there. Um, so Julia, what did you have any other final thoughts on the 69s? Yeah. Um, one thing that I wanted to say too about Carolyn is because she has only done these bigger meets, um, she has a level of composure that um is is not typical of somebody her age. Um, I was in the same flight as her at, at nationals and she was very composed. Um, she was very focused, she was able to grind out um, yeah. the craziest squat I have ever seen. Um, and so that, um, bodes well for her on the platform. I know, you know, these French lifters, um, like to kind of open heavy sometimes, um, sometimes go for lifts that are just slightly out of their wheelhouse. Um, and Carolyn is not like that. So she, um, will stick to her game plan and she will execute. And so I think that that's something, um, that's in her favor, you know, um, if, if either of them miss, you know, the door, the door is wide open here, um, for her to walk through it. Totally. Totally. All right. Couple other, um, weight classes, or unless you guys got anything else you want to say about Carolyn. Um, we got a lot of content on Carolyn out there. Like I said, press conference back in Austin, you can listen to her, her composure and everything and uh, handling those press conferences in the open nationals. Um, the, another lifter I want to mention is Jessica Kenny in the 76s um, should be in contention for a gold medal against Laura from France. I mean, Laura's got uh, 25 kilos on the nominations, 552 versus 525. But we know Jess Kinney is pushing and she's um, training really hard. And she went, she finished in third last year at the World Championships in the 84 kilo class. Now she's in the 76s. I think she, she put up a great performance in Scottsdale. I think she might have had one of the highest dots of any of the junior lifters in the 70 in, in, in all of the juniors, um, in Scottsdale. Um, and she looks like she's pretty comfortably in second and can possibly, uh, pull for first. What other battles and, uh, lifters from pop in America are you guys looking forward to Julio? Let's go with you first. Yeah. So I wanted to mention, uh, Jessica Kinney and, um, obviously we interviewed Eleni, um, as well. Uh, but, just does not post a ton. Um, and so she maybe gets overshadowed, but she is, um, I believe it might be her last year in junior. Um, she's definitely one of the, um, best lifters in, in the competition, um, especially from the powerlifting market side and her attitude towards lifting is also very impressive. Um, we did a press conference with her, 
after junior nationals. And um, I think it's still up. And I think, you know, yeah. um, a lot of the younger lifters um, should go listen to that because um, she says a lot of things that that are uh, really important um, as far as, you know, how how to approach lifting. And um, that's the that's the case with Eleni as well. Uh, a lot of these younger lifters now are they're their approach is very mature because they've been guided by people like Vin Mangioni and um, some of these other coaches. So they yeah. already know um, how they need to approach competition. So I expect uh, these numbers to just keep going up um, also because people are stronger and they um, have better training for er earlier on, but, as well because of the mental approach. So I, those are the two lifters that I would um, definitely mention here. Yeah. Let's talk about Eleni for a second. First of all, definitely. We, you know, got like a two hour long podcast interview with Eleni. Um, that's our latest podcast out right now. So definitely go take a look at that. Listen to her story. She's got a great background story. Um, she's starting off, you know, her, her idol right now, of course. Can you guys guess who it is? Well, I know the answer. So it's Natalie Richards, obviously the best lifter at worlds, best lifter in the world. Um, and so, but it, listening to that podcast, I mean, I, I dropped a stat in there that Eleni at her age is way ahead of where Natalie Richards was at her, at that time in, in her career. Um, her first few competitions, Eleni is way up there as a, and as a 17 year old, it's very impressive. She has a battle. This will be definitely one of the most fun sessions to watch. There's a three-way battle in the 57 kilo sub juniors, um, a lifter from Singapore and a lifter from Kazakhstan are right there. And the way that Eleni's training, this is her total from, uh, the, the 375 that she's nominated with the lifter from Singapore is nominated first with 379, but that total from Eleni is from way back in March at high school nationals. And if you know anything about sub juniors, you know, they put kilos on their total fast, her training since high school nationals, she was injured going into that. So that total was already lower than it should have been. And then on top of that, she's thrown together a lot of good training uh, since then. And she's started working with Vin Mangione, who's like the juniors and sub juniors whisperer. Um, like he's amazing with that age group for sure. Um, so yeah, Mike, what's your take on it? No, I think it's just going to be a, a very good battle. I mean, she said she'd be like happy to come home with uh, a medal, but uh, I think she's the favorite in my opinion, to win. Um, it's not going to be an easy, it's not going to be an easy weight class. I mean, we see there's a few people like neck and neck on nominations, but uh, her training is looking really good. Um, she looks ready to have a huge deadlift. So I think it'll be a fun weight class. And I think, I think she'll likely win. I, I mean, it's not, it's not as clear as like most classes. It's definitely going to be a tight one, but I think it'll be a very entertaining one. And who's your pick to win? No, I said, I think she's going to win. Exactly. Exactly. So I just want to make sure everyone, we reiterate that. Um, also, I want to give a shout out to Jessica Haggerty in the 52 sub juniors. She's another one who she doesn't post very much. Um, she is from kind of an old school um, area in Wisconsin where it's like, I believe she's in from Wisconsin and they don't post, they, they don't post their training very much. They keep everything under wraps. So you're not going to see much out of her again. She's nominated in second with a 327.5, and the lifter from Italy is with a 332.5. Again, Jessica is the reigning high school national champion. And that total is from back in March. And I'm telling you, she's an animal. Like she is someone that everyone is going to know her name when these world championships are over. We're going to do press conference. We're going to do behind the scenes uh, coverage of her and everything like this. She's a superstar for sure in the, in the making. She reminds me a lot of Turbo Tiff. Like she just has the same kind of mannerism and she's like kind of similar build and everything uh, as Turbo Tiff. I think she's a young Turbo Tiff coming up. And um, I think we're going to see something really special out of her. She's going to be one of the stars that people are talking about when these uh, sub junior world championships are over. Um, and she's also in like a three-way battle there as well, because there's a lifter from there. She's basically a, a sandwich of Italian lifters in first and third and Jessica right there in second. 
Um, they're all within like seven kilos of each other. So that'll be a fun battle as well. We don't know that much about her training. I've seen a little something on her stories lately. I know she's training and pushing really hard. And so I think she's going to have a hell of a day as well. All right. Are there anything else you guys want to talk about when it comes to junior and sub junior world championships? I, we haven't mentioned, I mean, obviously. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking about superstars, so we can't forget about Anthony McNaughton. With exactly. double thick, so um, he's going to be competing in the 105s. Um, I don't think there's going to be anybody directly competing with him. Uh, we don't have Coco Clement competing in juniors this year. Uh, there is one lifter who's like in the mid 800s and and um, making progress. So it's we'll see if he's able to push Anthony or not. But that'll definitely be one of the um, exciting things to watch, like from an individual standpoint. Also, unfortunately. Um, Zach Taylor has dropped out of junior world. So we're still going to have uh, Kyle Nowak in 66s, but we're not going to have two 66s um, showing up. So yeah, so I, be fun to watch. That was a last minute thing. And um, I think it leaves us one lifter short of having a completely full squad. So, um, but it's okay. We should still hopefully be able to win the team points on the men's side. We still got Kyle in there. He's got a 20 kilo lead over the second place nomination from Japan. If you know, Kyle, like he won the battle in Scottsdale against Zach Taylor head to head. And, uh, he showed out in, in, in Scottsdale big time. It looked like he had more in the tank as well. Like he was kind of cruising on the day. He talked about it in his post comp press conference that the peaking, uh, the, the taper, just absolutely took him away. Um, he had a hell of a performance. There's a lot of, if you go back and look on our Instagram uh, highlights from Scottsdale, I think it's just called Nats uh, on our story highlights that you can see. It just says Nats and it has the logo from, from Scottsdale. You'll see all the little interviews that I did with them, but in between squad and bench and bench and deadlift. And you'll hear Kyle talk. He's so composed. He's so, such a gentle soul too. Like took, had to take all this time to do a drug test and still came over and did his press conference with us afterwards. I got to remember, I got to get all these press conferences up onto that playlist, but Kyle is a stud. And then of course, yeah, I don't, I just want to circle back and say his name one more time. Anthony McNaughton, McDouble thick. If you're looking for like the solo signature performance of the entire world championships, this will be it. Um, you know, his training, he, he's doing, he's got a lot of things going on in his life right now. Um, he's training to be a, uh, come a firefighter, I believe. And so like he has to do more cardio and things like that than he would probably want to strength training and powerlifting can't be a hundred percent of his focus. Like maybe it was at this time last year, but we're, what are you looking for as far as a total is concerned out of Anthony? Honestly, it's, it's very hard to tell because I'm not sure what his focus is. Like at the moment yeah. in terms of, since there's nobody, like if there was somebody directly on his heels, I would say like, he's probably just going to do something like insane, but it really comes down to like how much he wants to push himself in terms of what else is going on. So I think if he pushes himself, then we could definitely see him total like 2k. Um, but if not, he might like just take it a little bit more chilled. Cause I don't like, let's see totals 880. I don't think there's anyone like that's really making a run at that. So it, there's a big range just because it, it depends. Yeah. I would say, I, I expect him to total 900 plus just because he definitely, he just, he has the ability to do it. So I expect to see it, but I guess yeah. we'll find out on game day. Yeah. Again, we didn't do a sub junior uh, or we didn't do a junior uh, nationals recap, um, but his performance didn't go the way that he wanted it to um, at nationals. He missed his third squat, missed his third bench, left some kilos out there, total 875. That's what he's nominated with. But just back in February, he did 900 and it looked like he did it with ease. Like he, I mean, I don't want to say cakewalk to 900, but he definitely had more in the tank. It was definitely a great, it was a pretty smooth day. He still missed five kilos on a third bench that he missed there as well. But, um, uh, as far as his deadlift and, and his squat, everything looks super smooth up there at that, at that local meet in Buffalo. So, um, he's definitely capable of going 900 and, and beyond. And I know he's got a bad taste in his mouth from the last world championships that he wants to get that out. He wants to win a gold medal. I think he'll be comparing looking at Coco's total. Um, that's the guy that beat him last year. Right. And so he's going to be looking at that total. Maybe he'll just try and chip whatever Coco did at Malta. I don't know what that number was. Um, but just something like that to kind of keep that rivalry going, um, over there. Um, Julia, any final thoughts on junior and sub junior world championships in Romania? Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I, I have a lot of thoughts. There's, you know, there's a lot, there, there's a lot going on here, but one thing that I think we should mention um, just really quickly is that the 74 kilo sub junior um, class will yeah. feature a rematch from nationals in Scottsdale um, between Jack Reynolds and Nicholas Gaines, which I don't know um, how many of you guys were watching that, but that was one of the more exciting um, battles and sessions of the entire meet. So, um, you know, the totals are only going to be higher. The stakes are only going to be higher. So I think that that's going to be a good one. And, you know, any, any uh, class where there's two powerlifting America lifters is always going to be a class that I want to watch. So. Absolutely. Let's get into that one a little bit. Like we, again, we didn't do a recap, but this was another one of these epic battles. Jack Reynolds born in 2007. I don't know what age that makes him, but he's super young is like 16 years old or something. Right. Um, and then Nick Gaines born in 2005 went toe to toe. Uh, Jack ends up winning with a six twelve, and, uh, Nick finished with a six eleven point five. Mike, what happened there? So, I mean, I don't really know what happened for most of the beginning competition, but basically what it comes down to is that um, Nick was a little bit behind coming to the last polls. Um, Jack had already pulled, and Nick loaded uh, 259 to take the national record and to lose by half a kilo. So, um, in general, you try to load to win, not to lose by half a kilo. I know it's, it happens everywhere. It's happened that worlds happens everywhere but uh, it's a very important thing when you're putting in your attempt selection that you uh make sure you know how much you actually need you make sure you know if you have the body weight advantage all these things are definitely something to keep in mind but um i mean now we're gonna get to see them both rematch again with uh there's a french lifter that's also over yeah also like a few kilos behind yeah so I think uh, it'll definitely be entertaining. And uh, now he's going to have the uh, national team coaches picking his attempts. So I don't expect him to load uh, half a kilo less than what he needs. I mean, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, sub juniors here. We're talking about the sub junior 74s. We've got two rising stars here. They're both super young. Jack is going to be a sub junior for a couple more years still. Um, he's so young and he's already totaling six twelve, So that's a, a rising star in the sport. I think a lot of people, the future is bright for the 74s. We've kind of seen, you know, at the highest level, you know, Taylor lost at the world championships. And we, we saw a couple of juniors challenging there, um, and ultimately finishing in front of him at the world championships. Is Nick Manor still a junior or he's just out. I no. think he just aged out of juniors, but he's still very young. Yeah, last year um, just... So we're seeing the new young cohort of 74s on the rise here um and so yeah it's gonna Manders be an 83, by the way who is man there's an 83 not a 74 oh i'm sorry it wasn't man he was a 74 um, back in the day but he's been i'm talking monogatti and, and even tim i think is still pretty young as well right it's but like, yeah you're right like, manders was before yeah yeah so anyway we know we know Callie's the young one he's the junior um that's like upsetting everything in the 74s in the open and so it's cool to see you know, just the new, new generation, new era. Um, all right. Any other thoughts on ju sub junior and junior world champions before we get into some more spicy conversation? Um, again, if you're listening to this, if you're watching live on YouTube, feel free to ask us questions about anything power team America related. We'll answer them, uh, live on the show. Um, this is just our second time trying this. We're going to work out all the kinks. We're going to get better at this and we're uh, going to advertise it more. So we get more of a live audience here, but for now we're trying to keep it a little bit low key so that, that we don't get overwhelmed. And so that, uh, if we mess up, then there's not too many eyeballs on us, but, um, all right, things, uh, other things that we want to talk about, um, just real quick, if you're going to be if you want to get caught up on everything that's going on with the uh, power of team America national team lifters, there's a bunch of podcasts out there. Eleni is on our podcast. Meg will be dropping a podcast. I keep saying it. I got to drop it like tonight or tomorrow. Um, we got Tristan. I got a recorded one with him. Got to get it out as well. Uh, Keiko was on the King of the lifts. We had Natalie Richards, best lifter at worlds on King of the lifts. 
Delaney was on King of Lifts and uh, Jessica Espinal was on the Solana Power and Lifting podcast. So if you're a fan of the sport, if you're a fan of Powerlifting America, you're a fan of Team USA and the American national team that's going to all these different championships, North Americans and Junior Worlds and Open Worlds, show your love for the squad and go get a hat or a shirt from the store. It's linked below and um, it's, it's on our website um, at the top. There's a button for the store. Go get a shirt. And go get a hat. I, we need to sell these out because once we sell those out, we can make way for some new designs and some new cooler stuff coming um, that I'm going to be spearheading that I'm going to be pushing. And we're hopefully going to have like a lot more cool new merch coming soon after that. Um, Julia, did you have something that you wanted to add? No? Nope. Nope. Um, other thing is, is that um, Bench Worlds, it has been announced. It is happening and it is being hosted by Powerlifting America in Austin, Texas uh, next year. It's already up on the IPF calendar. We'll be making more announcements about it soon. It's going to be in Austin. It's going to be huge. Like I've seen some of the behind the scenes stuff that we're doing with Bench Worlds. And um, we're going to have like a couple of athlete village type set uh, setups. We're going to have like some uh, areas at Aleco headquarters where there's going to be all kinds of cool stuff going on. It's Austin. So, you know, it's probably going to be live music. It's going to be a lot of uh, great food trucks, things like this. Um, and the, the, the preparation for it is already like in full force preparing, prepping for this, um, world, bringing a world championships to the United States. So it's going to be, it's going to be something for sure. Uh, we're, we're in the works on it. Mike, what's your thoughts in general about the U S hosting a world championships? Yeah. So obviously, um, long-term ideally, uh, we'd like to be able to host like the open classic world championships. Um, I think this will hopefully be a step towards it in general, uh, before countries get the whole a uh an open world championships first they hold like either like some form of originals or a junior or some one of these smaller events mm -hmm. so i'm hoping that this can help us with a future bid uh also i just think it'll be very interesting to see um with bench worlds being in the us maybe we get to see some of the like top level open lifters who have like phenomenal benches um do it which a lot of them normally don't really get involved in bench only. Um, mostly it's like a different crew of lifters, but yeah. like, I think it'd be really cool if we get to see like uh, Jonathan Keiko, who is probably, I mean, I don't really know about the bench only lifters in that weight class, but who's one of the best benchers in the world in any weight class. Um, if it's a, just a short two hour flight to Austin, uh, maybe we get to see somebody like Kim do it, or maybe Jonathan Garcia, who didn't get a chance to go to, open worlds this year, like in general, um, as powerlifting America is growing, making the open worlds team is just going to be really, really, really difficult. We have, we have like in every weight class, we're going to have killers and we're going to get to the point where there's not going to be any doubling up. So you're basically going to have to win your weight class. And a lot of these weight classes are going to have multiple people that are podium favorites to, to win world. So yeah, um, I think like an opportunity to compete, not just internationally, like NAPFs, but like at an actual world championships, uh, bench world, I think, I think it's something that in general, people might not have taken seriously, but if they don't have to go fly halfway around the world, um, maybe they're going to go and like, okay, I can get a uh, gold medal at worlds and it's a two hour flight. It's the same thing as me just doing this uh, competition with my friends. So I, I think it'll help. Um, I think it'll help us out. And I think we will hopefully get to see some of those lifters. Yeah, for sure. I think it's, it's going to be a spectacle for sure. Um, it's going to be really big, man, having it in Austin, um, for people that have been to our national championships there before they know about the Aleco headquarters, the Aleco barbecue, they know that Aleco is going to show up big time. Um, I don't want to give away too many more details about what's going to be happening, but I can tell you, we're going to be promoting it a lot. We want to show that we can host the world championships in the United States and have it be a huge success. And then, like you said, use that as sort of like our resume for getting more world championships to come to the u.s like people are always talking about why are these world championships in these different places wherever here and there and i can tell you that this will be like a good test for us to see if we can fill the seats if we can fill the seats at bench press world championships in austin um which will be in may 25th in 2024 um 
then that'll be a really good selling point for us to host more national championships in Austin, uh, uh, more world championships in Austin uh, as we go forward into the future as well. And yes, it'll be May 25th in 2024, which is good timing if our if our open nationals is sometime in the first quarter. And for the, all the people that you mentioned who didn't make the team, who don't make it to the world championship team, this will be a good opportunity for them to go go to Austin, have a blast, get a world, get some, bring home some gold medals for team USA, um, in the bench press event. And then, you know, maybe go to the North American championships, like a couple months later in the summer to go do full power competition and maybe make a mark, build your resume for a Sheffield wild card, whatever the case may be. So, um, also, um, just in general, you know, we're talking about international competitions for powerlifting America, and there's been some talk on other episodes, on other podcasts out there about the fact, and we're just mentioning it right here that, um, there's only 16 lifters that get to go to open worlds. Um, so if you're talking full power, open worlds, classic open worlds, there's only 16 lifters. And as Mike just mentioned, there's all these rumors of lifters coming over, you know, and it's like Bob Ashton, Russ, like a lot of lifters, uh, Brandon Petrie, uh, you know, like I just heard on the podcast today talking about, uh, Chris Perez, coming over as well. Like Joe game day was talking about that. I'm just talking about things that are out there and other podcasts. They mentioned it, you know, all on the King of list podcast, the two white lights podcast. It's all over social media. Um, and they're all rumors, nothing, nothing official. Well, but very, very rumors. We have like the official people, like I mean, just the, at the like additions of like Alexis and, um, and Celine, like, yeah, we were, we were, I mean, we won the, um, the team points at worlds and we're just adding in like other people, like, there's only so many lifters we can send. So yeah, we're going to be, yeah. I mean, we're legitimately at the point where like you, you can be a world champion or you could literally even win worlds the previous year. And you're not guaranteed to make the world team the next year, because there's going to be somebody else in your weight class. That's at least close enough where there's going to be a battle in a lot of these weight classes. Like I was going through it earlier today. And like, like in the 16 weight classes, like, there's only going to be like four or five of them that, that are going to be pretty easy wins for like the lifter who's um, at the top. But most of the other ones will have at least one lifter who's close enough where they're really going to have to battle. So I, I think like it's just going to be interesting, like in terms of people like switching over, people that are already here, just to make it to a world's team will just be so difficult. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Julia, do you need to go take a break? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll be right back. All right. Yeah. Just mute your mic. Um, all right. So, um, it, and so what I was getting at there is like, um, since there's only 16 spots, there's all these lifters coming over. I mean, like if you listen to the King of Lifts podcast today with Joe Stanick, um, it actually like sounds like it's going to be a mass exodus. Like there's going to be a lot of lifters coming, um, especially when the superstars come, you know, give it another year, you'll see a trickle down effect that then more of the, you know, uh, national level lifters will come as well. So just for people to know out there, when you come to power to America, the world, the world championships, the open world championships is not the only, uh, international competition that you can compete in. There are a lot of other international competitions that you can compete in. So first of all, when we're talking about the world championships, we're talking to, yes, there's the open classic world championships that everyone knows about, but there's actually six world championships overall. You have the open classic, you have the open equipped, you have the junior, the sub junior masters, you have university cup, and you have the bench press world championships, all of those different things. So there are a lot of other meets for you to compete at just at the world level. If you're a junior or sub junior, you're a master. Um, if you're in college, you can go to university cup. Um, and then obviously classic and equipped as well. But beyond that, we've got the North American championships, which we just talked about for like 30 minutes. It's got a stacked lineup this year. It's even more stacked than it was last year. It's a competition that's growing. And as we get more competitive and Canada also gets more competitive as well, um, that it's going to be a big deal to win, to be able to claim that you're the North American champion. Um, it'll be as big of a deal as you, the, being the European champion in euros, which everyone knows is a high production, high quality meet. That's where we're going to get at with the North American championship it's classic it's equipped it's all age groups masters junior sub juniors open all that then you also got the arnold uk if you don't make it on a national team if you're someone like jonathan garcia for instance who comes very close has that world championship level pedigree of standing on the podium and getting the silver medal you can apply to get invited to something like the Arnold UK and power of the America will help facilitate that application process um, same thing with the silent worker competition in France 
Mike, you know, a little bit of something about that. I mean, it had lifters from a lot of like other places in Europe that are coming over. Yeah. So Panna at Worlds, um, he invited some of the American lifters. Um, It was a little bit late. So none of the American lifters ended up going, but um, there were lifters from Great Britain who were there. Uh, Jurens was there, uh, a few other. Um, Then there were were lifters from a bunch of different European countries that were all invited and all competed. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them, some of them um, were lifters who didn't compete at Worlds, and some of them were lifters who had just competed at Worlds two weeks prior. But um, it's a very, it's a high level meet with like literally, um, it's like one day of just like international level lifters, and then just you also get to compete with like all the regular people in France who want to lift. And yeah, uh, I mean France is going crazy right now in terms of powerlifting. Like uh, uh, Six Pack keeps saying on his podcast that like there was like an hour hours worth of lines to take pictures with Panna. So yeah, uh, we, we got to, that's something that we got to do. Actually, we got to get to the point where we have some sort of local me- I don't know. Local meets, not the right word for it, but a competition where we can have our high level lifters do um, that either the ones who are, are doing worlds and want another meet, or just like, we're going to end up with really high level lifters who are not going to make world team. So, yeah. Something where we get like elite lifters together. So we have to, somebody's got to produce a meet like that in the U.S. I mean, it's not the easiest yeah. thing in the world, but I think it's definitely something that people want. Like I've spoken to uh, high level lifters who either are considering switching or whatever. And something they want is like, it's nice to be able to go overseas, but to have a, like a, a meet on our own, like turf like that would be definitely something pretty big to work on. Well, well, you could flip the script. I mean, let's get Pena and all these people from France to come over and go to like one of our national level meets. We'll call it a national level local meet essentially is what it is. Right. I mean, it's like, um, yeah. it's something like the Arnold, right. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Um, which trust me, there are things in the works. Um, power of America, we mentioned it, uh, last time, you know, we're only like a year and a half old. I mean, I think this fall sometime in September, October is like officially like the two year anniversary of powerlifting America from like when it, when Robert Keller and Mike Zolinski, like actually, made like, uh, incorporated the Federation or whatever, but obviously, you know, our first competition wasn't in our first major competition. Wasn't until, uh, 2022 in April, it was our first national championship. So we're barely a year beyond that, you know, a year and four or five months, but beyond that. Um, so we're still growing. We're, we're, we got things in the works. There's big local meets that are going to be popping up. That will be high production, high quality meets, um, that are going to draw big crowds. Um, we already have the one, which is at the Legion sports festival in Reno hosted by Tamara Lopes, who is one of our assistant coaches at the world championships. And she's a treasurer on the executive committee of power in America. It's in one of these bodybuilding arena shows where it's like a big sports expo with all these different types of things going on, like an Arnold situation. Um, and it's going to just get bigger and bigger as time goes on. And then there are plans in the, in the works for other big time showcase level, national level, uh, competitions, um, in, on our own soil, but also, um, just hitting the list of, of competitions for women. They can also go to France and compete in girl power, which, you know, we were going to have Heather Connor on here today. I think she got tied up with something, but she might not be able to make it. I don't think she's going to make it, but, um, she's going to be competing in that. Chelsea Savitt is also going to be competing in that. Heather did it last year. You know, Jess Bittner did that meet last year as well. So there are things, for, there are other, uh, international competitions for you to go to. And then in addition to that, We've seen it before at Power of Team America Nationals where the first year in 2022, we had Team Jamaica come and list, lift as guest lifters in our national championships. And then this year, we had a lifter from Puerto Rico come and guest lift um, Jonathan Rivera. He's awesome. I hope that we get to hang out with him in the Cayman Islands. He's, a, he's an ultimate badass. And he's a superstar on the rise in, in the future of the sport from Puerto Rico. But same thing, American lifters, if you want to go compete in like Japan's nationals, or you want to go compete in Australia's nationals, or you want to go compete in one of these other countries, national championships, um, as a guest lifter, we can facilitate that process for you as well. So there's a lot of other things that you can do if you want to travel internationally. And then of course, we're going to get our local meets up in power of state America. We're going to get like a national level local meets, um, something like, you know, on the level of like something like the corrupted classic, which we saw as like a freaking amazing meet, um, and things like that. So, um, we definitely want, want to do that. There's also talks in the work to, to get it, um, some regionals as well, but you know, we're not there yet. We're not there yet with Power in America, but we'll, we'll get there. Eventually the long-term vision is that we will have a lot of these kind of 
big showcase meets. Um, and then we will obviously have all the international meets, but give us time. We're like a year and a half old. We've already taken like, you know, over 250 lifters overseas to international meets. Um, it's, it's a lot of work to run these national teams. We see we're taking a 108 person team to the North American championships this year. We're taking a 60 person team to Romania for the junior and sub junior. We did the same thing last year in Turkey. So it's a lot of work. There are a lot of lifters that have competed overseas for pop in America, but all right. Any final thoughts on this topic, Julia? Yeah, go ahead, Julia. Are you going to yeah, say something? Um, well, I just, just going off the topic of like, you know, growing, growing the sport um, and growing our federation. I think um, you and Mike hit on a good point about um, Panna and, and um, Panna, sorry, I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name, but um, you know, the, the one hour lines um, just to meet him. Uh, France is really modeling how um, this could be a professional sport. And I think that it would behoove us to kind of look at what they're doing and um, try to emulate it in some ways, because I think that they have um, a good system down there. I mean, there's, whenever I watch, you know, Europeans or worlds or anything on the um, live stream in the comment section, there's just like hundreds of people posting those French flags and, and all that stuff. So I think if we can get, you know, uh, some American lifters into these meets um, and we can see how we can run them and we can draw attention to our sport here in the US, I think that that's gonna be really good. I think that these meets really are um, the future. It's, you know, there's the, the big meets, there's like worlds, nationals, all that, all that, but, um, also important are these invitational meets where things are a little bit different. Maybe there's a little more, um, you know, flavor involved in what's going on. And we can really see um, the creative side of uh, what the meet directors have to offer and where people want the sport to go without being, you know, rigidly tied to certain, you know, restrictions that, you um, prevent certain things within, you know, like worlds and, and all that stuff. So I think that that's really the future. And I think that um, if you want to see um, how that is, you know, tune in to these events. If you're in powerlifting America, apply to go to these events and, um, you know, just take notes. Yeah. I think, I mean, a really big point is that the superstars in France are super involved. Like, Penna, Leah, Turbo Tiff, Jad, you see them all over there. They're refing, they're hosting meets, they're directing meets, they're running companies around powerlifting, things like this. We got to challenge our own lifters, you know, from those 16 lifters that went to the world championships in Malta, who's going to raise their hand and host a meet? You know, who's going to raise their hand and do a silent worker type of a competition like Panna's doing? Um, we need that from our superstars. And I can tell you, I think Delaney Wallace is one who's going to raise his hand and start doing some stuff. Um, talking with him after the world championships in Malta. Um, he definitely has some things that he wants to do, but we see a different level of involvement of the superstars in France. And I would just challenge our lifters, you know, and, and Mike Gold, you know, the people that you're talking about that are saying that they want more of these silent worker type of competitions. It's like, well, come and raise your hand and come, let's help us do it. Let's help us build it. You know, um, it's always easy to, um, to request and to, to complain about things, but it's a lot harder to actually go and do it and make a difference out there. And I think what we saw in France is just a handful of people, handful of superstar lifters who just said, we're going to put our head down and we're going to work and we're going to put, and we're going to host meets and we're going to do things. We're going to innovate. And, um, you know, we see that over here in Power in America with the media team, especially, you know, we're trying to innovate, we're trying to push, we're trying to do things. Um, but I'm not, a, I'm not a meet director, you know, I'm not going to host a meet like this. I got my hands full with the social media and stuff like this, but someone else out there, if you're hearing this, and you want to run a big meet, a super high production invitational meet that's flashy and can attract lifters from all around the world, raise your hand and let's go. You know, any, the sky is the limit with Powerlifting America. If you send us an email, if you DM us Powerlifting underscore America, we'll get back to you. You know, like we'll actually get back to you. And if you want to do something, we'll let you do it. So um, just come on over and, and volunteer to do whatever it is that, that you want to do. And we'll make it happen. We'll facilitate it. All right. Any other thoughts on this before we move on to the next topic? We're going super long here. So we got to, let's get through some fun, spicy stuff. No, nothing. All right. So, um, current events, Mike, uh, so let's skip the first one because we're, we want to talk about that with Heather. We'll talk about that next week, but basically 
women's sports is blowing up right now. Um, talking about uh, FIFA World Cup, it's the U.S. women's national team. Mike, don't don't furrow your brow over there. Uh, ain't you, I know you don't. I don't know you don't like soccer. Um, but no, that's no, okay. that's not. That's not. You what keep I was your thinking. cancelable I was, opinions. I, I wasn't thinking about soccer. I was thinking about the biggest uh, women's sporting event news that I heard this week. Uh, what is it? You, you, you heard what happened at the WNBA game? I did not. Tell me. You did it? Oh my gosh! This better be appropriate. Uh, Go ahead. Well, it's funny. Basically, this YouTuber, this big YouTuber, uh, bought a bunch of uh, courtside seats, and he laid down and took a nap during the game. Oh! And he got bit. He got, but no, he got his punishment. So, forget with it. You know how the WNBA is like, kind of run by the NBA. So the NBA banned him from all NBA stadiums, like. Oh. Yeah. Wow! So wow! It was that's like, crazy. It, it, got, it was like, it was massive on Twitter. It was. Yeah. This is not a good time to mess around with women's sports. Um, the women's sports are blowing up. Like I said, FIFA World Cup, uh, the women's World Cup's happening right now. Uh, we got the U.S. women's national team over there uh, kicking ass. They already won their first match three to zero. Uh, I'm not a soccer fan myself. I like my little sister played soccer. I, I cared about it when she was in it, um, but I haven't paid much attention until now. Nike has been rolling out these ads for like the last month or so. I've been seeing them all over my feed. And they're so good. They're, they're hooking me into caring about women's soccer. And I mean, and I'm also seeing like um, the, the U S women's national league uh, soccer, women's national soccer league in the U S is also blowing up. And then of course we've got probably like time magazine person of the year this year could be angel Reese um, from the NCAA uh, LSU tigers who won the national championship and had one of the most viewed women's one of the most viewed college sporting events of all time, um, women or men. And she's absolutely blown up and become like a massive superstar has over a million followers now on Instagram, stuff like this, uh, women's basketball in general. So I guess since we went ahead and already talked about it a lot, let's just go ahead and talk about it. Um, how do you think powerlifting fits into this whole, uh, sort of like resurgence of women's sports, or maybe, maybe it's not a resurgence. What would you call it? Let's go to Julia first, Mike. <laughs> well, um, I, I wouldn't so much call it a resurgence as um, maybe, you know, women's sports is is going to a point where it it is um, there's more focus on it. I think one thing that I learned um, when I took economics classes a long, long time ago is that uh, the best way to raise a developing economy is to um, give women access to education and jobs. And I think one way to raise the, you know, bring that over to sports, um, one way to um, enhance sports and make sports um, an even bigger market is to promote women's sports. And there are, you know, tons of amazing women, female athletes um, and, just they traditionally haven't been promoted, but we see now, especially with powerlifting, um, as the women's side grows exponentially, we see people, you know, shattering records, things that we've never seen before uh, start happening and they start becoming common very quickly. Um, and with the men's side already pretty saturated, um, the women's side growing into um, it's a like more mature talent pool is going to be in many ways um, just as exciting, if not more exciting, depending on, you know, what you you like um, to watch as far as powerlifting goes. So I think that um, that is where it fits in, where there's just going to be a lot of unprecedented things happening um, and people pushing the limits of what we thought was possible because of having had less of a talent pool and less of a focus on women's sports. For sure. Um, so yeah, Mike, what's your take? Go ahead. So my take in general is that the thing with sports in general, and especially women's sports, is the question is who's watching it, right? In terms of in sports in general, like who is the audience? So I think what makes parallel being like potentially different than all other sports is I, th I think for the most part, um, most of the men care very much 
about women's powerlifting, right? Like they follow it, they know what's going on, they watch it and vice versa, right? Like the men are watching the women, the women are watching the men, they're both like involved, everyone knows what's going on. Um, there's like, a, I don't know, it's not equal yet, but like a very similar level of participation from both sides, a similar level of like star power, right? Like, like you, it's not like the biggest stars are men, no, like you have men stars, women stars, they're equally like, like, I mean, the biggest stars probably are women right now. Yeah, I was um, going to say, who's the biggest star in powerlifting right now? Joy. I don't know. In terms of in powerlifting, I would say probably the biggest star. I, it's, a, it's a tough question. because I mean, Leah like, has a book. She's on Good Morning America. Right, She's right. Like, that's the thing. Like, there's no like one answer. Like It could be Leah. It could be Jessica. It could be like there's a lot of yeah. answers. And the Joy, point is that, it could like, be Amanda. Yeah, right. So the point is that like there's a lot of answers and like men, women, equal, like there's no like there's no real difference in terms of um, the amount of engagement and amount of viewers, like they're both getting like everyone. So I think that's something that like powerlifting has over other sports is that like, personally, I'm like a very big sports fan, but I have never, and I don't think I will ever sit down and watch a WNBA game. That's like the honest like opinion, but I can sit down and watch hours of women's powerlifting. I don't yeah. know what the specific, I don't know what, like what causes the divide, but, but I believe it's not just me. I think in general, like powerlifting is, I guess one of the only other sport that I know that's like this really is tennis where um, there's basically equal levels of interest on both sides. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's something to do with like it being an individual sport and like you get more of a, um, more of the characters for the actual individuals rather than like the team. I don't know if that's the reason. Mm -hmm. but I think powerlifting is really like that. So I think we're like these other sports, these other women's sports that are growing, it's good, but I think we're like already ahead of them in terms of like, in terms of like get, um, the participation levels. And actually one thing I was thinking about that I just thought about a few minutes ago when you guys were discussing it is that if we think about like stars, right? Nowadays, if you see some freak like high school athlete, right? Who might who theoretically could have been the next best powerlifter of all time ever? There's a big chance this kid's gonna go to the NFL or something like that, right? The the, the freaks are the freaks. But on on the female side, I don't think there's like that thing. Like there's no NFL. There's no like so yeah, they could yeah. go. They could be an Olymp they could be an Olympian. But I think we're getting close to the point where like being a world champion powerlifter has more exposure than being an Olympian in track and field. I, I mean, I think we're past that point already. Yeah, like I think I, I, I can't tell you who the uh, Olympian, like the gold medal uh, throwers are, but I can tell you who the gold medal like powerlifters are in every single weight class over the last bunch of years. And I think even more, even more casual powerlifting fans can know basically all the world champions. So I think we're going to get to see like talent, like, I mean, as it is, like the records are getting broken, like pretty quickly. Uh, the numbers are being taken to like something that we didn't know was possible. And it's only getting more and more competitive. So yeah, that's my take. In terms of just like the spectacle, it's there's not anything else out there that's similar to powerlifting in the sense where you see women doing like the same thing that's directly comparable to what men do, right? Like, cause like you see tennis, like Serena Williams has like however many grand slams. It's like, yeah, but she's also, you know, she played all those against other women. It's not directly comparable. Like you see her serve speed or whatever is like similar to some of the men or whatever the case may be basketball. You see women putting up a ton of points and stuff and it's, it's kind of comparable, but you never see them like head to head. Right. And whereas on in powerlifting, you see a woman squatting 600 pounds. It's like that blows people's mind. Like, and you're right. Like they, they see dudes doing these monster hits in football, but you, there's no compare. There's no, there's no counter example of a woman, like just like making a spectacular touchdown catch with one hand, like Odell Beckham or whatever. Right. Like, so you don't get, you don't really see those like directly comparable things. Whereas in powerlifting, they're on the same flight, you know, like you're going to see a, a bunch uh, several women come out and squat 600 pounds. And you're going to see, Hey, Zeus come out and squat a thousand, right? Like you're going to be able to see them side by side, like basically doing their thing, which you don't see that in really any other sport. I do think tennis, maybe golf, you know, a woman that can drive the ball as far as Tiger Woods or something like that, like could get someone's attention. Right. But um, yeah, you don't, that's one of the things I feel like as women's sports across the globe becomes more uh, popular, like with all these things we're seeing um, with these women superstars that are coming up in other sports that are super mainstream, 
I think there, that's only going to be beneficial when people come across powerlifting because they're going to already be ready. They're already primed and ready to be accepting of women's sports in the way that we do it on the same platform, in the same competition, the same number of weight classes, same number of medals given out to men and women, right? Um, whereas like even in tennis, the women only do three uh, sets, three sets, right? Yeah. Right. Whereas the men do five. And like, so that's just like one of these little things. I always know why women can go five sets. That doesn't make, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but yeah. And so again, it's like, well, Serena has, uh, this many grand slams and, uh, no, Djokovic has this many grand slams. Well, but he did his with five set, you know, it's just, it's not as comparable, um, as it is when you see like, uh, uh someone like Bonica squatting 600 pounds and you see Jesus come out and squat like Sheffield is a good example where you have a, all different, you know, uh, the, all the world champions, men and women, 12 of each coming out and hitting these huge numbers one after another. And it's like directly comparable. So I just think that's what makes, I think that powerlifting is going to blow up as women's sports in general blows up. Um, Julia, what did you want to add? I, I saw you want to say something. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think that you, you hit on a good point here. Uh, I think that, you know, some other women's sports that are maybe at a similar place are the track side of track and field in the Olympics um, and also um, gymnastics and maybe swimming, although, you know, swimming isn't really like a, a mainstream sport, but certainly yeah. gymnastics. And I think, you know, what separates powerlifting from those sports um, isn't really how women are featured, but it's the fact that the sport is featured and there's, you know, Nike sponsors the athletes and they have the Olympics. And that's why, you know, we're trying to get the sport into the Olympics because that is where we can really shine because we already have, you know, we don't have that, that handicap like tennis where we hold, you know, the men and the women to different standards. Um, yeah. we're, we're a lot more like, you know, sprints and distance running and gymnastics where, um, or, you know, gymnastics has slightly different events, but they shine just yeah. as equally. And so with, you know, the Olympic spotlight, if, we have more big sponsors come in. Um, that's where we can see um, women's sports really start to shine, um, and especially with powerlifting as well. Um, I think you know it's it's done great for um, weightlifting. Um, maybe not so much here in the U.S., but around the world, you know, there's um, people can make a living um, being a weightlifter because it's in the Olympics. Um, women are just as big of stars as men. Um, you know, I think like. Ho Sing Chen, the, um, the 59 kilo uh, world champion Olympic medalist, I think she she is, has a position in government or something or did. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's where we have the potential to head if we can um, push this sport into a place where more people and bigger actors start to take notice of it. Good points. Mike, any final thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, the one thought I would just say is I think one of the reasons why powerlifting like um, doesn't necessarily have some of the issues that other mainstream sports have in terms of the male versus female. It's like if you ever like are bored and read through like the comment section on like any like WNBA highlights or anything, you see like a lot of delusional like teenagers and stuff like that who like legitimately think that they're better than these WNBA players. But because there's no way for them to actually compare, they're never going to play them. So they don't know who's better. Yeah. But there's something, I mean, the weight doesn't lie, right? This, this high school kid looks at it and sees this, this uh, Bonique or whoever is squatting 600 pounds or whatever specific numbers they're doing. They either could do it or they can't, right? And usually they can't. So like there's, it's a little bit easier to appreciate because it's so purely like objective or subject, uh, whatever. Yeah, uh, it's objective, Ob objective. Yeah, it's so purely objective as opposed to like, some of these other things where like you can just like delude yourself into thinking that, Oh, they're not really good. Yeah. So I think that was like you, if you, I mean, so we have a post that we have collabed with joy Ryan Fleisch that has like 5 million views or some crazy number of views. It's her meat recap from Scottsdale where she finished in second place. And every single day there are comments on that post. Like since it's been like over a month, it's been a month and a half to this day. 
there's probably 10 new comments on there today of especially young men talking shit about her bench or talking shit about this or that or the other thing, her knees on this or whatever the case may be. Right. Um, and it's like, yeah, we'll go out and do it. Can you like, are there any other of these 18 year old boys out here that can bench like 250 or whatever joy is throwing down? What's she benching like 260 now? Um, her bench is just like absolutely blowing up. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's directly comparable. That's a great point. And that's, and anyone can do it. You can go to any local gym and, and see, you can say like, look, I can squat more than Bonica, right? I can, I can't squat as much as Bonica, you know, whatever the case may be. And so it just has that more general interest. So I do think like we're sitting on a gold mine here in powerlifting. I think powerlifting is really ripe to blow up. And I think uh, if we can get like, if in general, so I think probably long-term trajectory of women in sports has probably just changed a lot just in, in since the eighties, you know, where, um, there was a time when like women didn't even think about doing sports. And then now I think, I, I think that every, especially in the U S um, women grow up doing all different kinds of sports. Like, if you, and at the more that they just generally become sports fans and get involved in sports, um, then that becomes a massive audience. I mean, if you just think about like going back to like the eighties or the seventies before, uh, you know, women had as much independence, it was like, the, the, the demographic of who's watching sports was half of what it could be. Um, if, if women were to start paying attention to sports, like think about the possibilities of doubling the viewership just in sports across the board by getting more women involved and more women engaged. That's something that we have going for us. I think a lot of other sports don't. So uh, I think it's going to be huge for us. Any other thoughts on this? Okay. Uh, who's the biggest star in powerlifting right now? Let's just do this take. And then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap this one up. We'll end it on this. Uh, Mike's got to go. Um, we went on and on about NAPF and junior and sub junior worlds. So if you're listening to this, don't worry, we're not going to do that every time. We're going to get into more of these spicy fun takes where we talk about current events and topics um, in sports in general and just general sports talk. We got a lot of fun ideas that we can bring up next week. Maybe we'll do a surprise live show uh, before next Monday. Who knows? Because we got a lot of content here to go over. Um, but okay, if you had to pick one person, biggest star in the sport, who would you pick right now? In powerlifting, I'll say Jessica. Jessica. Jessica Bittner. Jessica Bittner. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say Being Jessica Joy, Espinal. She's Joy one of the smallest stars. Joy we definitely have more followers and more reach. But the reason why I'm saying Jess is because a very high percentage of Joy's like followers and reach have nothing to do with powerlifting. Like they're Joy fans, but like they have no idea. Like they know nothing. Like if you read comments, like you can see yeah. they know nothing yeah. about powerlifting. So uh, I'll say her. Julia? Yeah, I mean, I, I could agree with that take, actually. I think that that's a pretty smart take because, um, yeah, I mean, you know, everyone kind of, everyone knows Jessica Bittner. Uh, she, she gets reposted a lot um, in the context, not just of powerlifting, but, you know, bodybuilding and stuff. I think some people, there's a large percentage of people on Reddit that think she's a bodybuilder still, which is just hilarious to me. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, I, I think that that's a good one. Um, at the risk of getting banned, uh, getting this episode banned, there's some other people I might mention. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say her, I would say Leah just got a, a big was it like a I don't know if it was a contract or something but she was featured in like Disney France yeah um he was so, doing stuff man by the way Julia you don't need to worry about getting banned the true answer is the biggest powerlifting stars are not IPF the biggest powerlifting stars are Larry Wheels and Steffi Cohen it was that's the actual answer okay yeah they have, they, they have million they both have millions yeah. of followers sure like, but they're both arguably not powerlifters I mean correct. like like I mean, like, I mean apparently not powerlifters, like we're talking about cool. people that are like serious powerlifters like like well, that's I mean, their sport like when we talk have, about track and field they athletes have the most, they have the most like world, like i'm saying they have the most world record to mind of like like meaning they they became famous as like stuffy has broken more world records than anyone ever and same thing with sure, like, but there's like, probably some guy out there running like a 50 meter dash somewhere that is saying he's faster than the fastest track star or whatever but it's he didn't they're not doing it in the olympics you know what I'm right. saying? So it's like, they also, that's don't, the have, they also don't have millions of followers. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, they, that's the key here. The key is not like what their performance, I'm just saying, like in terms of pure reach, like pure reach. If you're going by pure reach, then, then in terms of the IPF is concerned, I think it's got to be Joy. Like, yeah, I think yeah, Joy yeah. has the biggest reach of yeah, anyone. Right. 
Yeah. Um, am, and it's amazing to think. That's not why I was worried. I mean, I would also, you know, maybe add uh, John Hack to that list, um, but I, I didn't really want to say the R word because uh, if we mentioned certain people, the the podcast might get taken down. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people um, inside the IPF and outside the IPF that. Um, we can you know, say are... Russ is the, one of the biggest stars. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Jeez, he's. <laughs> He's a multi-time IPF world champion. Come on. Um, yeah, obviously Russ is one of the biggest stars. We're, we're talking about all across all feds here, but, but I mean, l- let's be real though. Like, I don't think you say Steffi Cohen today is a power lifter, right? She's not competing in world champions. She's competing in boxing. Um, I don't think you can say Larry Wills is a power lifter. He doesn't compete in like a serious federation um, in, in power lifting anymore. He's like a bodybuilder. He's like a fitness influencer okay i mean right, and that's right. like basically right. now, now what steffi what steffi is saying and then now go ahead julia though uh, we're yeah. talking power lifters the biggest star go ahead julia yeah um but i think one of the things that we can get from this is that even though these people are big stars a lot of their stardom you know maybe has come from like you know um going into like their foray into boxing or strongman or whatever but the the ipf stars are really holding their own here and you know for anyone who says you know lifting is only going to be entertaining if it's you know everyone's allowed to take drugs and people are pushing their limits um that doesn't appear to be the case because uh all of these ipf stars have huge following um and everyone recognizes how hard what they do is so i think that um that's a good argument for trying to get like circling back to get the the sport into the Olympics is we don't need to just be, you know, a a freak show where, you know, people take a lot of drugs. Like people are entertained by pushing the natural limits. And these people do build a following, you know, to become micro celebrities, maybe even one day uh, actual celebrities and certainly enough to make a living off of it. So um, that's, that's something that, um, uh, that's really good. It's, it's really refreshing to see. All right. And then, uh, who, so basically we've, the three names that we've mentioned as the biggest stars in the IPF, um, in the sport of power thing, which I think if, you know, the IPS or, or maybe you could say other federations are, are legit as well, but, um, we've mentioned Jessica Bittner, Leah Bavois and Joy Reinfleisch. What about the men? Like we haven't mentioned, and we mentioned Russ, I guess we mentioned Russ. Panna, Panna right now. Panna, right. Up. Panna in the world. Yeah. What about an American? Who we mention as a man in that's currently with Power Team America? I would just I would say Jesus is the biggest like male on the American side, but I think right now, like in terms of just pure growth, like Panna, not just because of like his lifting, but the way he's like just he totally transformed, like basically introduced the sport in his country and in general, and just like expanding and like like I think the people with the biggest potentials to be like the biggest influencers in our sport are the ones who are in the market who are not really fully captured yet and whoever becomes like the panna of china would be yeah. would be the biggest there's billions of people like so like the thing is like it's hard to be the individual biggest influencer when you're in a market where there's like a lot of people who are already like pretty big like there are a lot of americans who have like like big like who have a hundred thousand followers 100, 000, and have like viewers yeah, yeah. So like, it's harder to like stand out in that market in terms of like being the first person to like bust into a new market. Pure reach on the men's side. There's one guy that stands above everyone else. And I think he's even above Russ and that's Lane Norton, Dr. Lane Norton. Um, again, though, he, he, he's, he's a, a nutrition influencer, fitness influencer across the board but he competes in a serious federation for world. She's a world champion, reigning world champion in powerlifting. Powerlifting is his passion and his main thing. And he puts us on that platform. And you were talking before about joy and like her audience being not just powerlifting. I think and, and lane is similar where he reaches a lot of people that are not in powerlifting that are just like new people are interested in nutrition. People are interested in fitness in general. Um, same thing with joy. She's reaching that same kind of audience. That's good for us. That's actually better because like you just said, they're reaching an audience that hasn't already been captured. 
Um, if you look at some of the other lifters, if most of their followers are people who are all following King of the Lifts or all following uh, a bunch of other power lifters as well, like they, that market has already been saturated. We already captured all the people that are in powerlifting. If you're in powerlifting, seriously, you're probably going to be following King of the Lifts or Jesus or whatever, right? Panna or whatever it is, but like Joy and Lane, they're bringing in people out here that are from, that don't have any interest in powerlifting, but they suddenly see Lane like screaming and they see Joy benching 250 and stuff like this. And it's like, whoa, let me get involved in powerlifting. So I think that's a really big deal. I think Leah kind of has that too. She was on Good Morning America. She's doing that book. She has a book out. She's doing the thing at Disneyland. You're talking about Jess Bittner also uh, reaches that kind of audience as well with the whole bodybuilding fitness world as well. Um, Julia, do you have final things you want to say on this? And then I know Mike Gold has got to bounce. Yeah, I mean, uh, this this might be a good time to to mention um, maybe not so much of an influencer, but uh, John Gruden. He he's a, a trainer in the. Uh, I think he's a strength coach for um, a professional football team. So the Raiders. Um, team yeah, the Raiders. So yeah, like I mean, we have this sport has a lot of um, reach, and it's related to a lot of other sports, and we have a lot of. Um, potential there as well um i mean that's that's a name that you know it might not be synonymous with powerlifting, but um it's it's known um especially his, his dad is is you know extremely well known in the sports world so yeah um yeah that's a really good point. Um, damn it. I wish Mike Gold didn't have to leave because that could bring us right into yeah. the John Gruden invitational um, I think, we'll I think we're just Let's just cut it here so we can literally continue this conversation next time. Because Yes, yes, we will. So is, let me yeah, tease it real actually. quick. Let me just tease it real quick. We're talking, there's something out there in the works, in, in rattling around in Mike Gold's head only, and maybe mine now, uh, about the, the John Gruden Invitational, where maybe we see football players going head to head against people like Jesus, and we bring our best five squatters and our best five bench pressers. And we go see who the NFL's best. And there's one man that can make this happen. And that's John Gruden. He's got the connects to make it happen. Um, also uh, another teaser topic talking about uh, powerlifting, where it will be in 10 years and where uh, the type of venues, very similar to the topic here uh, about the John Gruden Invitational is uh, one day, maybe we'll see powerlifting in Madison Square Garden or at the Staples Center or um, at that new really ugly looking stadium that they built out in Las Vegas for that team that we won't mention the name. Um, I wouldn't want to host one there, but I guess if they called us, we would do it, but um, maybe out there in SoFi in LA, like that beautiful new football stadium that they have. Um, wouldn't it be sick to see powerlifting on a platform on a stage like that? Um, other things we'll talk about it, We already kind of went into the biggest, who are the biggest stars in the sport, which powerlifter should get their own shoe. Um, so which palette right now you think should get their own shoe? We'll, we'll answer that question next time. Um, but yeah, these are some of the kind of topics that, um, we had to talk about the spicy topics. We, we went on and on about North American power championships, uh, because it's coming up so fast in two weeks. Um, we will do a full on preview show for that. Um, we also talked a lot about junior and sub junior world championships because it's coming up in like five weeks and we will do a full preview show for that where we go, you know, weight class by weight class. Um, but yeah, uh, Julia. Any final things before we sign off? I you, I see you're saying something in the chat. It is called the Staples Center, isn't it? No, they changed the name. But it's oh, irrelevant. damn. See, I haven't I been watching to, basketball. I was about to, No, the point is, like, you can't – there's certain stadiums you can't change the names. Like, I don't care what they officially yeah. change it. I just say everyone in L.A. was so angry about that. Like, what do they call it? What's it called now? I, it's I don't like even know. the Crypto.com Arena or something. Oh. And it's just – yeah. Like, it's, it's always going to be the Staples Center. The I hate that. I, I I honestly, I don't, I can't, I Listen, mean, Hey, how stadiums officially called AT&T stadium. Now I'm never going to call it AT&T stadium. It's called. Well, listen, stadium. I will change my name to AT&T Bellinger if they give me $5 million. All right. So I don't, I guess <laughs> I'm not one to talk. I shouldn't, I should, because if they came the power, we've well, changed the whole name. Arrowhead of some stupid name. Would you call it some stupid name instead of Arrowhead? It already is called like Geha field or some weird thing, but, but, but um, but it, it's still Arrowhead. Um, but they okay. they now their naming rights are for the field, not for the not for Go the ahead. whole stadium, whatever. But hey, I mean, if 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 uh, Amazon wants to change the name to Amazon Powerlifting Federation, um, and give us like ten million dollars over here, Pop the American, we 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 might sell the name, the whole naming rights and everything. So who knows? Like it's easy to say that you wouldn't do it uh, from a fan standpoint. Uh, but when that hey, when they when they write the check and the money's there, 
it was hard to turn it down. So um, hopefully we get to that phase though in powerlifting. That's that's the vision that we have here in powerlifting America is that we want to be in a place like a Madison Square Garden one day. And hopefully they won't change the name um, to something silly, but um, maybe they'll change it to powerlifting America Arena um, by the time everything is all said and done 50 years from now. So let's keep the vision big, right? Um, it used to be known as Madison Square Garden. Now it's called powerlifting America Arena. It's where we host all the world championships. Um, but anyway... Let's wrap it here, guys. Um, I really appreciate you for coming out and doing this. We're going to have a lot more fun with these. This one, we had a lot of business stuff to get through, um, but we've got a list of topics and we're going to bring in special guests. We were supposed to have Heather here, we're supposed to have Robert Keller here. He's going to pop through one of these days. Oh, I'm getting in text. I have, I'm on do not disturb, but Robert Keller texted me. Celine Crum just registered for my contest uh, October 7th. I think uh, the North Florida Open Championships. It looks like she's going to be competing on October 7th. So Celine Crum, breaking news here, uh, is going to be officially have a date on, on the books. Uh, we have a segment of this where lifts of the week and we didn't get to it because we spent so much time on that other stuff. She just hit a 240 pound bench triple today, uh, bench PR. So Celine Crum can't wait to see her power off the America debut. Now we at least have a date so I can start making story posts where I say, uh, how many weeks out she is and everything like that. But anyway, all right, Mike, peace out. And uh, Julia, thanks for coming. Thanks to everyone who listens to the Power Up Team America podcast. Um, and we're going to be doing this for now, at least on Monday nights. We might sneak in another one. We got so much stuff to talk about. Maybe we'll do a Friday night live. Who knows? We'll see. But for now, be ready to come and tune in on Monday nights with your questions and comments. We're, if you want to be on the show, if you we'll, we'll give the Zoom link to some people. If you want to come in here and chit chat, talk about sports talk, stuff like this, um, DM us, Power Up Team underscore America. And we'll, uh, we'll get you that invite to the zoom call and we can get you in here and we can talk about some stuff. We're going to try to line up some more special guests. We'll try to get Robert next week. We'll try to definitely get Heather. Um, I really wanted Heather here to talk about women's sports blowing up. That's a great conversation. Maybe we'll bring it up again. Um, and then when we're in the North American power thing championships in the Cayman islands, we'll, we'll try to do something. We might have to push the show a little bit later in the day. Cause it's a packed, it's a packed day every day. Like we'll be going pretty late every day with the lifting. So we'll see what we can do. Plus we'll be doing all our post-game press conferences, stuff like that. So we might push pause on Monday night live for that, but um, at least for now, we'll see you again here, 5 30 Eastern next week. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure you follow us at powerfully underscore America. We'll get the links for all this kind of stuff and uh, stay tuned for more podcasts dropping. If you, you know, wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's Spotify or Apple or wherever, subscribe to power Team america podcast um so we'll be dropping more things we'll post this as a podcast as well so you can play it back later and it'll all be up on youtube so all right thank you again to everyone and thank you julia and thanks uh spicy mike spicy mike gold uh we got to come up with a nickname for the man with his golden takes um mike gold um thank you as well so all right peace